All right, with wanting to stay on top of time for everyone, we will get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I'm Tara Kalidowski, Director of Community Impact for Education at United Way of Marathon County. And I also provide staff support for the Marathon County Early Years Coalition, which is hosting this series in May. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm going to just kind of run through a couple of housekeeping things before we begin. Um, we are recording tonight. We will be recording each of the sessions. So just making that aware to everyone that that has started. Um, if you have questions at all throughout for Dr. Hartwig, feel free to enter those into the chat box and I will voice those um, during a Q&A session towards the end of our time together tonight. Um, so please keep microphones on mute. We would certainly love if people feel comfortable to have their cameras on. Certainly not a requirement, but if you, um, you know, are so brave as to join us visually this evening, we would certainly appreciate that. So, um, but I will kick things over to Dr. Hartwig. Um, so Dr. Eric Hartwig has served as an adjunct professor, professor for educational leadership and policy analyst at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and as a research advisor for the Cardinal Stritch College Milwaukee and Aurora University Wisconsin campus. Dr. Hartwig retired as an administrator of people services for the Marathon County Children with Disabilities Education Board, continues to provide consultation and training on behavioral health practices, and is a principal partner on the Best Universal Screening Behavioral Health Project with Marshfield Clinic Health System and Security Health Plan. So we're very excited to have him here with us tonight and look forward to the next hour together with everyone. So Dr. Hartwig, I'll turn things over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Tara. I appreciate that. Good evening, everyone. I also appreciate all of you participating tonight, and I hope that this will be a meaningful time for the next hour. And that if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat and we'll talk about them at the end of the session. I want to welcome the Early Years Coalition and all the team support and United Way for sponsoring this event. As you can see, uh, the lineup for the next month is going to be incredibly positive for all of us in the community. And I'm very honored to be part of that. So thank you for the invitation. And uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Tonight, we're going to talk about how we can support children in real time and the types of supports we can deal with and provide in a systematic way in the home environment, in the school environment, in the community. But what I'd like to start out with is really a few small introductory remarks. And I think it's important to sort of set the stage for the discussion. We know that clearly in this last year, nothing has really been very normal <clears throat> in our life structure and that many of us have been affected by the changes that is, have occurred. And that's particularly important for not only us as adults, but also the implications that that might have for the children that we are responsible for and that we provide support to. So what I'd like you to look at as we go through this next hour is I want us to look at the life challenges a little bit differently not as a barrier as some would have us, uh, uh, as some people suggest or what we see on TV, but as a challenge. What is it that we need to know and what is it that we need to do differently to be able to provide the support that our children are going to need in order to, for them to manage their world? I don't want us to forget the life experiences, but what I want to do is let's talk about the things that are helpful to help us manage those situations and to help children meet their expectations and the life structure they have. Stress and anxiety is very interesting. And really, while there's quite a bit of anxiety that, of what that has occurred over the last year, it's really about more than stress. It is about the curvilinear relationship between stress and, and anxiety, and that we know that some stress is good, but unrelenting, unrelenting stress depletes our emotional energy. We need to recognize that we want to find a way to balance that. But we can see the implications for that in ourselves. Let me ask all of you, and let's be honest for just a minute. Have you found yourself in the last year perhaps a little bit short of temper? Maybe something that usually wouldn't have bothered you might set you off a little bit. Have you ever uh, uh, been prone to verbalize something, a thought that you had about something that somebody did that maybe would have been better left unsaid? Uh, we're all, all in a little bit of uh, a, a funk sometimes and a little out of tune. And what I'd like to suggest, if it affects us, think about the implications it has for children. Depending on the research that you might read prior to COVID, anywhere from 35 to 45% of school-aged children were so stressed 
or anxious that it interfered with their ability to engage in the activities and the things we would like them to experience in a positive way. We know that that's probably changed. We have no way to measure what that change is at this point in time, but we can ass assume that there's gonna be some differences. The good news is that we know that the majority of children, even when they're struggling with difficult situations, will be able to mediate that as long as we provide effective caregiving and support. Children, adults need two things in order to deal with difficult life challenges. Number one, they have to have skills. So we have to teach kids the skills we want them to have to be able to manage their world. And we want to provide the effective caregiving that adults can provide in a meaningful way in real time. So what I want to suggest to you is there's a simple message that I'd like to get across tonight. We can agree create and engage in task of self-confidence, and that will be the natural enemy of the anxiety that we've been experiencing. We know for a fact that behavioral health is about learning, any and all learning. When you learn something new, you feel better about yourself. And we know that when you form relationships with significant others who are positive and appropriate and supportive, it can affect the way you feel about yourself. We know that the significance and the importance for connecting is unmistakable. But we also know the converse to that is the implications for not connecting with adults or other people or other children our age is also unmistakable. So what we want to be able to talk about is really what's the implications for self-regulation? How do we teach children to learn and manage their emotions and label them and to make good goal-directed decisions about behavioral pat patterns that they ought to be engaging in? What does that mean? Well, self-regulation, like literacy, is something that we can actually teach. It has three distinct components. The ability to script out potential solutions, the ability to manage and label your own personal emotions in a way that reflects your age and knowledge basis, and number three, the ability to make goal-directed decisions. I want you to think about this for a minute. When you think about the last time you were anxious or the last time, for example, you lost your telephone or you lost your car keys, we certainly elevate our emotions and it makes it hard for us to problem solve. We forget where they are and we start to panic because we don't know where they are, we need to have them. And we know that if we don't have a ca effective caregiving and skills to manage that moment, the outcome will not be positive and will not be helpful to our ability to solve that problem. And we want to be able to create the opportunity in life for kids to be able to self-regulate. We want them to understand their emotions. We want them to be able to label them. And we want them to be able to understand that they can share them in an unfettered way and that we can allow them to have a feeling that we might not agree with, but to provide the guidance and the support that they're going to need in order to successfully manage the challenges that they are ex ex been exposed to. Children look to adults for three simple things. This is an absolute critical aspect of helping children understand their own needs. Number one, that they're gonna have access to adults. That means when they have a need, when they are struggling, that they are gonna recognize that they are going to have access to adults. Number two, that those adults are going to help them and not hurt them. That they're gonna to move to other adults in a way that will provide support to them. And unfortunately, there are some children in, on, in our world that adults are not helpful, that adults are punitive and rejective and oftentimes inconsistent in their behavioral patterns. And what we want to be able to do is to show children that any adult that they might encounter can certainly be trusted and recognize that they will help them and not hurt them. And the third and the one that I think is particularly important for our discussion tonight is this that we need to create an emotional tether with kids so that they're capable of exploring their world. When children want to reach out and learn something new or approach a different life experience in a way that they've never been exposed to before, they need to know that they have an anchor. They need to know that they have this emotional tether with adults. And every one of us have experienced this, whether it be with a child of your own or a grandchild or a neighbor's friend or even a, a uh, uh, you know, a friend of yours where there's this connection that we make with others that allows them to become more successful as they approach difficult choices that they are going to make in their life. We want to be sure that kids are safe. 
in our work, but we also need to understand that they need to feel safe. It's not just about being safe. That's important. Children have to feel safe. And I want you to think about that for a minute. In the last year, when you would see something on the news or when you would hear something about somebody that was struggling with, with COVID or, or somebody relative that had a difficult life experience, we know that it's hard for you to feel safe. You might be safe, you're in your home, you know, you may be wearing a mask, you may even have been vaccinated, but the reality is that sometimes because anxiety creeps in through the back door, you don't necessarily feel safe. And that feeling is something that we have to be able to provide and support our children and each other with. We have to be sure that they not only are safe, but they feel safe as well. And we create that environment for that to happen. So what can we do? What are some of the things that we can do and we can acknowledge? Well, first of all, relationship informed parenting matters. We all know that, but what I wanna suggest, it's a little bit deeper than the normal way we communicate and connect with our children. We want to create positive time that allows children to know that we're going to help them when they're stressed. We're not going to hurt them. We're not going to make their problems more difficult. We're going to be able to provide the opportunity to help them. We need to deliberately and specifically seek out the, the importance of forming relationships. Whether you are a classroom teacher, a paraprofessional, a parent, an aunt, or a relative, or, or a school practitioner in some other form or action, we need to show children that we are interested in decreasing the anonymity they may feel and making that bond and creating the opportunity for them to connect to us in a positive way. Relationship informed parenting and uh, instruction have significant meaning for children. Secondly, we know that behavioral health is, is about learning. Think about this for just a minute. How many of you had children of your own when they were little and they were first learning a new skill. Let's just take learning how to walk. Think about how many times they would try to stand up and they'd fall down and they'd stand up and they'd fall down and go over and over again. And what would we do as parents? We would encourage them and we would support them in every possible way. We were incredibly excitement, excited, but what was driving the force was not us. There's an innate desire in children to want to learn. And the idea is that the drive, while we were reinforcing that, the drive to stand up and fall down, even in the spite, in spite of not being always successful, is what's critical about behavioral health. We need children to understand that they need instruction and modeling and practice in real time on how to really feel good about their emotional well being. We have to provide those opportunities in a systematic and consistent way across the board. We need to do that by creating a purpose in their world. We have to create a meaning for them that goes beyond academic success, goes beyond appropriate compliance and obedience, where it becomes an, an analysis of individual and personal self-worth. We have to create the opportunity for children to learn in a safe environment that allows them to express their emotions and feelings so that they can learn to make goal-directed decisions in appropriate manner when we're not there to support them. Think about those of you that have children that are going off to college or have gone off to college for the first time. And we know they're going to a new life experience. If you didn't prepare them for those opportunities, if you didn't give them and help them develop the skills to manage their new world, we're gonna experience, you're gonna experience some difficulties. Well, the same thing applies for all kids in all age spectrums. We want to be able to understand that behavioral health is about learning. We need to create learning opportunities that have purpose and a meaning for that individual child. And we need to reinforce them so that they can start to generalize and explore their world within the system. We need to learn to interrupt the fight or flight response. We need to learn to manage our reaction to children. One of the things that I find to be the most distressing in my work is how easy it is for adults to personalize what children do. If children misbehave or children engage in inappropriate behavior, somehow we think it's uh, about us. And almost all the behaviors that you see in children that are not acceptable oftentimes have very little to do with you. It has to do with other things, other issues that are the genesis for the behavioral pattern. But when you personalize it, 
what happens is you oftentimes become very punitive and very goal-directed and not supportive and helpful. You're about compliance and obedience. And the more we try to control and manage children's behavior instead of understanding it, the less likely we're going to be successful in helping them to be able to manage it as well as us manage our emotions. It always surprises me to see how an adult can react to a child in a way that's completely inexplicable. And it doesn't matter what the age of the child is. It could be a two-year-old in a grocery store, and you can see parents struggling to try to manage a child at the checkout counter. We need to understand that at our job as adults is to help children manage their world, reduce their fear, decrease the reactivity that they might experience by low-level stimulus, and we need to increase the opportunities for positive effects. Our job is to guide children just like we do when we teach an academic skill. If a child doesn't know the alphabet, we teach them the alphabet. And some kids, we provide it systematically, and we think of all sorts of different ways to do it. Well, the same thing applies to managing your emotions and your feelings. That's why self-regulation is the key to the discussion and the importance for resiliency and coping. The ability to manage your emotions and label and problem solve is a critical aspect of human growth. But what we have to be sensitive about is this. Some kids don't have the capacity to cognitively problem solve potential solutions. And age doesn't always have anything to do with it. Clearly, younger children struggle with knowing what they should have done in a difficult situation. But some kids who are older, we assume, think they do. And they, when they don't, we personalize that and we hold them accountable to something that they're not capable of doing. I have had many adults tell me, well, I know that child knew what he was doing. He should have known better and he should have known that he should have done this. And it's entirely possible that's true, but it's probably more likely that when he did that inappropriate behavior, he didn't know what his options were going to be. In the moment, this young boy or girl was escalated and were not capable of making the good decisions. It's our job to provide guidance for them and to be able to help and show them in real time and to do it in a preventive and meaningful and supportive fashion. We need to build on our health when we start to talk about the things we can do for children. Let me talk about that for just a minute. You know, we're all happy um, when we're happy. And the reality is, is when we're sad, we feel bad because we wish we were happy. And the thing that most people don't understand is that happiness and sadness are on the same continuum. You can never be happy in life unless you've been sad. And what we want to be able to do is recognize, while it's important to work towards happiness, the reality is we also, all, we also have to teach children to understand that you can be happy with what you have, but you can even be more happy about the things you don't have that you don't want, so that we can find that balance between the things in life that are good for us and the things in life that are not good for us that we don't want. We want to be able to build on a child's behavioral health in a positive pro-social way. We were working on a project with Marshall Clinic on universal screening, and as of today, we've screened over 236,000 completed screenings on children. And one of the interesting things about the data that we've collected, about 85% of the children that we've seen in terms of the data we've collected, and this is a universal screener, are fall within what we call the healthy range. And the assumption is is that what we are going to do is only target kids who are struggling. And that's really not the purpose behind this project. Because in order for us to deal with the children who are struggling with behavioral health issues, we need to reinforce the healthy children. The standard of comparability is who's healthy. It is not who's struggling. It's who's healthy. And how do we take those children who may not be healthy, how do we take them from a, one situation to another so that they're more likely to move into that healthy range? How do we decrease the levels of inappropriate behavior but reinforce the behavioral patterns that are already present in our world? And we fail to recognize really how positive things are. I want you to think about our world right now. It certainly doesn't take much time for any of us to turn on a TV or listen to a news report and find all sorts of sad negative things to, that are happening in the world. And we begin to assume that's what the world is, is everything is unhappy. And that's just absolutely patently untrue. We know 
that there are many good, healthy things that are going on, but we don't bring those to the level of discussion. When somebody tells us something positive, we don't seem to be as interested as when they tell us something that might be negative. And we need to turn that thinking around. I'm not trying to be a Pollyanna and say that we ignore inappropriate behavior. What I'm saying to you is let's take a look at who's healthy. Let's take a look at the good decisions that children are making. Let's take a look at the good decisions that adults are making. Let's try to celebrate the positive things instead of only focusing on the things that we don't particularly think are positive or healthy. We need to build on our health and we need to reinforce it in our children. And we need to have a standard of comparability. Not this is wrong, but this is right. This is the path that we want to go on. And how do we get and guide you and what supports can we provide as parents or as adult caregivers with children? What are the things that we can do? We've identified some trends and patterns in children that I think are particularly important in our database that I think will be very useful for our discussion tonight. The one thing that's very interesting is right now, people are talking about the pandemic academic slide and they're talking about the behavioral implications that it's going to have on children. And the assumptions may be 100% correct. The problem with it is though, is we don't have really a baseline. We don't really have any data collection to tell us where kids should have, where they should have been and where they are right now. And the same thing applies to behavioral health. So I want to be sensitive about the fact that there certainly are issues that we have to recognize, but I don't want us to focus on those things. I want us to be able to focus on the things we can manage, the things that we can do as practitioners or the things we can do as parents or as effective caregivers in, a, in, a, in, a, in the adult world for the children that we encounter in our world. And we need to be able to provide interventions that are not about doing something to the child, it's about providing the environment so that they can be far more successful. We can control all of the independent variables that will affect how children behave. By manipulating and controlling those variables, we can increase the likelihood that children will use guided role models of healthy children rather than kids that are struggling. So what are some of the real-time things that I think you can do as a parent or as a classroom practitioner or as a neighbor? First of all, really relationship building. I, I know that everybody talks about relationships and we all think that we're very much geared to relationships. We know that you're born with the innate ability to want to learn, but you're also born with the innate ability and responsibility to connect with adults. Many of us have seen the FaceTime studies where kids and parents uh, uh, connect with each other. And we also know that it's critical for us to be purposeful and deliberate in our practice and forming relationship and decreasing anonymity. We need to reach out to children who feel uncomfortable about their world. Kids express their behavioral patterns in three distinct patterns that are observable to all of us outwardly in ways that are disruptive and hurtful and, and, and sometimes create conflicts with others around them. Inwardly, when they become sad and withdrawn and struggle with relationships and confidence issues, and then a combination of both those uh, behavioral patterns. And what I wanna suggest to you and say to you is that relationship building increases the likelihood that we're gonna have an impact on a child's life in ways that we may never know. Let me give you a prime example. When I was a young man a long, long time ago, um, and I started kindergarten at Hogan Elementary School in La Crosse, Wisconsin, a large elementary school, there was one individual in that school building that knew everybody in that, every child in that school, and he knew everybody's child's brothers and sisters. I came from a very large family, 10 children, all of my brothers, and I was the ninth of 10 children, and my mother uh, uh, I like to independently think that I was her favorite. I don't know if that's confirmed or not, but that's what I'm going to say for this discussion tonight. But by the time I went to school as the ninth child, the thing I want you to know is when I went there, this person, this individual in this school knew my name before I even walked in the door and he knew all my brothers and sisters. And if he did the same with every other child, how did he do that? I don't know at the time, but I will tell you this, every kid Every one of my friends, everybody I knew in that school thought that this gentleman was their best friend. His name was Mr. Schultz. He was the school custodian. He knew me by name. 
He knew me about, he knew me from my family. He knew the things that I might be interested in. He had a way with kids that I can't even describe. And at the time, I thought he was just being nice to us and was being helpful to us to manage our world. It turns out now, as I'm uh, through my work and my research, I realized that when he was giving to us, we were also giving to him in a way that was self-sustaining. It continued along a path that allowed him to continue to focus on relationship because it affected kids, but it also because it made him feel good about himself. And the same thing applies to all of us. We need to learn to be far more aggressive and, uh, and, and proactive about forming relationships, whether you're the children of your own or whether they're children of somebody else um, in, in your vicinity. We need to make purposeful time and provide deliberate practice to connect with kids in ways that we've never connected before. And nothing could be farther or more important to us given what has occurred in the last year. And there's everyone in this uh, a meeting tonight has experienced this loss of, of connection and this loneliness that's associated with what occurred under the quarantine and some of the time we were gone. And the important part about that is this, it reinforced in a positive way how important it is for us to have relationships with each other. That means we can take that difficult time and use that coping cap capacity to build the future. We need to ramp up our ability to connect with kids and each other in ways that we never have thought were necessary before. Easy to do, easy to talk about. We need to make a deliberate practice and about who we are. We need to decrease anonymity in our relationships and improve connections with others. And also, by the way, teach the skills to our children on how to form relationships, but also how to avoid destructive relationships. Number two, what I like to say is that in our work, um, people like to think they're positive. And I'm sure that if we were in a room and I asked all of you to raise your hand if you thought you were a positive person, most of you would shyly raise your hand. And you would do that with the idea that you know that I was going to tell you that you're actually not very positive. We are adult contingent based. If you do what I want you to do, if you behave and act in the ways I would like you to behave, then I'm happy. But that's contingent-based happiness. What I'm talking about is non-contingent-based happiness. We can't own another child's happiness. We can't own your happiness. What we can do is help others own their own happiness. And when we're positive, we say things like this. Gee, Eric, you did a great job on this work. You know, thank you. So I'm now thinking of my responsibilities to please you. It has nothing to do with me getting acknowledged for the fact that I worked hard to get the answer correct. I want you to think about this for just a minute. When you were a little baby, or if you have children in your home that are little, you know that everything that we give them comes from the outside. We provide all the external control to make them happy and do the things that they need. But as they grow socially and emotionally, they start to value the point of learning independently. That intrinsic transition is an important part for motivation and drive about learning new skills. But when we own a child's happiness, when we give them something that they haven't earned, it's not helpful. We need to have children own their own learning. Think about this for just a minute. Let's just transition to a non-contingent praise component. Eric Hartwig, you did a great job. You put a lot of effort into that. But I got to tell you, it must make you feel good. Do you see the difference? First model, I feel good about what Eric did. Second model, Eric feels good about what he did. We need to transition from the external control to the intrinsic control. We need to make kids understand that effort is as important as outcome. Catch the good have the children own it, makes kids feel better. Behavioral health is about learning. Remember, any and all learning that you own. Number three, we gotta take the time to really play. You know, I would hope that most of you certainly have experienced some playing hooky from your job over the last couple of years, because I know that even in this Zoom, maybe some of you have your camera off, and you're doing something else rather than actually paying attention to this conversation, which is fine. 
But what I want to say to you and what I think is critical is if you think about it, over this last year, we've been able to do some things that normally we haven't been able to do before. Maybe we took a little more time to listen to music at home. Maybe we took time to really read a good book and not feel guilty about it. My point here is this, when it comes to children, play is a very important time for them. And we need to be able to immerse ourselves in, them, in their play and really truly embrace it. Let me give you an example. We know that there are many movies that are specifically geared up to children. And some of them are hard as a parent or an adult to watch. They they're, they're, don't have the same meaning to you as it does to a child but it has meaning to your child. And if you don't engage in that with them in a meaningful and immerse you, immerse them, yourself in it, then all of a sudden they become disconnected and the film or the movie become more important than the relationship with having you there. Think about the joy that comes from reading a book to a child for the first time, a, a, a book that you think is so interesting and sends a message to the child, but at the same time it makes you feel good as an adult. Pouty fish, I think that's the name of it. It's a great story. You know, it's a, I, I love reading that. Uh, you look at some of the other books that we have read to children and by immersing ourselves in it, it can actually make you feel different. I learned this lesson for my girls. They loved it when I would read. And I will tell you, they would pick books that had the longest, they were the longest books, pages and pages. So I thought there's no way they could know if I skipped a few pages. So I would read a few pages and then what I would do is grab three or four right in a row and I'd go to the next one, you know, and I'd be at the end of the book and they right away, they would say, dad, you forgot something. And they would make me go back to the beginning. I learned very quickly that my time was not as important as their time and my time with them. So we need to really immerse ourselves and play in a significant and meaningful ways that let children know that we care about them, that we think it's important for them to be involved and it's important for us to be there for them. We had time to do that in the last year. I'm curious, when we start to become more normal in our work, what will take priority? What will we be doing with our schedules and how will we be creating purpose in our life and what's going to be important to us? Well, I'm hoping that people remember that this last year taught us some very, very powerful human relationship emotions that we could never ever um, a lose again. We have to bring them to the surface. And the way we do that is we play and immerse ourselves. And I will say to you, you know, maybe you'll even find yourself a little less focused on your work or the things you think you should be doing. Because when you're involved with your kids and you're making them feel happy and good about themselves, turns out just like Mr. Schultz, you might feel happy about yourself as well. Reflections of feelings. You know, as a parent, we are fixers. As an adult, we are fixers. We like to solve people's problems for them. And it's the last thing that we need to do when it comes to behavioral health. One of the first things you learn in my, my field, in my practice, is that you learn to reflect someone's feelings. You're taught to be like a mirror so that when they tell us how they feel and, and what emotions they are experiencing, we listen to their, their feelings. We don't judge them, we don't evaluate them, and we certainly don't tell them how to solve their problem. I'm wondering for all of us adults that are on this today, how many times have you ever gone home after a difficult day and you wanted a significant other in your family to just listen to your sad, sad story? So you started to share your story with that individual and somewhere along the line, the individual whether it's a husband or whatever it might be, a caregiver, a brother or sister, or mom or dad, they started to say to you, well, you know, did you ever think about doing this? Or do you think maybe you should have thought about this? And all of a sudden, an emotive relationship that you were creating is now gone. And now you may react to the person and say, listen, you're not really hearing me. You're not really paying attention to me. And what I'm suggesting to you is this. If we're going to reflect someone's feelings, we have to have them own their own feelings. There is nothing that we need to do to solve their problem. What we need to do is to let them express and emote their feelings in such a way that their emotions can deviate from that escalation and move to calm so that they can learn and come up with their own solution. 
And our job is to help them guide, find their solution in their life. Reflections of feeling is about listening. It's not judging or evaluating. It's not providing the solution to the answer. And I frankly think that we jump to that so often in our world, in our adult world, that pretty soon kids have no capacity to manage their emotions or make good decisions when they're confronted with them. Again, the goal here is this. We want to move kids from that external control that we guide everything to them making decisions that are in their own best interest, that they solve their problems and sometimes suffer the consequence for making a bad decision. That's life. But for us to guide them, not to leave them alone, but to guide them, to provide support, but to help them to be able to express their feelings so that they can then determine exactly what they're going to do. We don't want to under to undertake responsibilities for them. And I think they need to be able to take responsibility for themselves. And again, we guide them in a significant and emotional way. And there are many ways we can do that. One of my favorites for parents is this. I call it good morning and good night. It means that every morning that when you greet a child, you take three to five minutes. There isn't a parent or an adult in the world that can't put three to five minutes aside to talk about and say hello to their child in the morning and say and appreciate them. And if you can't do it in person, you can certainly do a video. You can do other ways to connect. Personally, I like the, 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 the personal view and the touch. But you can say good morning and talk about how did you sleep last night? What are you going to do today at school? And what do you think about lunch and all this? And you could talk about it. And then the last thing you say to them is, by the way, I'm going to see you tonight when you get home from school. And I can't wait to see you. It's that emotional tether that I was talking to you about so that they can go off into their world, explore the world that they may not have ever experienced before. Because when they look back, they know that we're always there. And then at nighttime, before they go to bed, Another three to five minutes where you connect with them in a way that allows them to talk about their world, what happened during that day, maybe share some of their feelings and thoughts and ideas, likes and dislikes. And then you put them to bed and you allow them to be able to recognize that tomorrow morning, I'm going to be there first thing to see you, to set you up for the day. Good morning, good night. Simple little approach to be able to make a connection to a child in a way that allows them to understand that you care about them and you are connecting with them and that your time with them is important. The final thing that I think uh, for behavioral health that I'd like to share with you, and this is absolutely critical and more so even now than ever before, is we have to be able to provide predictable, reliable structures and routines. We have to build back into our world structures and routines of things and one of the most important is sleep patterns. We're doing a study on a number of kids that we've seen in our data that um, there's huge sleep pattern disorders in very young children. And as I'm doing the research, there are some very astounding things that I found that quite surprised me. First of all, the number of hours that a, a, a elementary age child is supposed to be sleeping, anywhere from nine to 11 hours a night. Think about that for just a minute. Middle school, 10 hours. Think about the way our school system is set up by schedules and bus routes. It's not about what's necessarily good for kids, but what we have to do as parents is make accommodations to the real world and our children. And we need to start looking at the patterns of routines and recognizing, for example, technology is put to sleep before the children are put to sleep. We need to have a separate place for them to put their technology so that when they go to bed, that the bed is there for sleeping. And when they're in the bed, they should be sleeping and not engaging in other activities that are not in their best interest. We need to provide structure and routines. And when we can't do that, we need to make appropriate accommodations and modifications in the school environment. We need to let kids know that we can provide the opportunity for them to be able to manage their sleep patterns in a way that maybe we can't do in the real world, but to adapt to it in the school environment. In the study from Mayo Clinic, they talked about non-REM and REM sleep, and I'm not going to get into much of the detail except this. Turns out that REM sleep, the time you dream, is the time when your brain nourishes all the systems in your, in your body and helps us rebalance our world. And REM sleep is important. It turns out REM sleep can be made up. Non-REM sleep, which is getting ready for bed and falling asleep, are, are not makeable times. But 
REM time is. So if kids don't have patterns of, of, of sleep at night, we can create opportunities for them in the school for a rest time or a period of break in the school environment. We need to slow their world down. I think every one of us have learned some very important lessons in this last year. And one of them is this. We were on a treadmill, this speeding treadmill that was on a steep incline. And all of a sudden, all this happened. And it turns out we still got things done. We still were able to do some of the work that we did before. Some companies and some people in some situations were even more productive than they were prior to COVID. My point here is this. Maybe we could take a step back and maybe we can slow that treadmill down just a little bit. Maybe we can decrease that incline and maybe we can help children and help ourselves to connect a little bit more with the real things that are happening right in front of us. I'm certainly a, a victim of driven expectations, but I will say to you that this has made me look at things differently. And when I look at our data from the kids that we have in our, our project, we need to be serious about recognizing the importance of time-sensitive behavioral health growth and to recognize that behavioral health is real time. You can't tell me if I'm sad today that I'll talk to you on Friday or I'll, I'll, we'll deal with it on the weekend when we're not busy. You can't tell me that that's a helpful way. When kids are sad, it means right now. We have to help them in real time. When adults are sad, when adults are struggling, we have to help them in real time. The good news with behavioral health is that we have years and years of research that shows that people who have been exposed to difficult life experience, including kids, about two thirds of the population um, recover. Resiliency is the norm. There is a term called post-traumatic growth, that difficult life situations has helped improve our ability to become more, to be able to cope and be more resilient to the future issues. And that's something that we want to be able to reinforce as we start to look and support children's behavioral health. There are many, many things that we can do that are even more detailed, but I just wanted to give you a brief overview of some things that I think will be helpful. Taking the time to have time. I remember when the individual told me that when I was in high school, I thought, what a funny thing for somebody to say, but how truthful and meaningful it is today. We need to take time and step back and make time with our kids and with each other, form better relationships, decrease anonymity, and reinforce positive pro-social behavior. Let's catch people being good. Let's acknowledge the relationships and the good things we see in each other, and let's make sure that we know kids and reinforce kids and let them know that what they do is about them, that what they earn is about them. We have to move from that control to helping kids manage their own world and understand that their effort determines the outcome of, the, of, of their life experiences. We need to practice at this. Life challenges, what the question should be is not, is it a barrier? It's what do I need to know here? that I don't know now? What skills do I need to have in order to manage this issue? Life is difficult, no doubt about it, but imagine it wouldn't be as meaningful and, and positive to us if it wasn't. If it was easy, anybody could manage the world. We uh, have to understand that we want to help kids explore theirs and provide an opportunity for them to do that systematically. So my time is up. I hope that was helpful. Uh, it's a fast walk around the block. I understand that. But if anybody had any questions, I certainly would welcome them. Um, I can stay here all night if you would like me to. Um, I'd rather not. But if that were necessary, I would be happy to make that commitment to you. I did have my two Mountain Dews today, so I'm okay till about 1030, maybe 11 o'clock. So, Tara, is there any questions that people might have or any concerns or anything they'd like me to clarify? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Hardy. Um, we do have a question coming in. Um, Heidi is saying that you talked about helping kids feel safe. She teaches preschool. Do you have any suggestions on how to do this other than structure and routine? She has a, lots of, a lot of students who've experienced trauma. How can she help them feel safe? It's a great question. Well, what's very important, and it depends on how you look at trauma, but trauma is something 
we can't undo. It's already happened. So the key here is that we have to do and deal with trauma in real time. What's the manifestation of trauma? Remember, trauma in, 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 uh, uh, in a void affects children very differently than when you have effective caregiving and support. So in real time, things that I think about is this. Model appropriate behavior in the classroom. Model your own emotions. Every one of us experiences difficult life, ex difficult um, uh, opportunities. What we want to do is model that to children to show them how we manage it. And when kids are elevated, for example, when you see an angry child or a mad child, it is more likely a frightened child. It's a child who feels it's, it's their response to not having in control of their world. So what we want to do with the structure and the routines is provide some control to them. And the way we can also do that and reinforce it is by also managing our own emotions. It's interesting, you know, um, the fight or flight response is live and well in all adults. So when a child challenges you, your brain automatically reacts to it in a way that might escalate. We have to learn to lie to our brain. When a child challenges us, to remember that their challenge is not about us and that what we do, if we can remain calm and we can provide the support necessary, we can show kids, hey, she's okay, he's okay. He, he, can, he can manage his emotions. He's not going to hurt me or she's not going to hurt me. I promise you that kids who have been exposed to difficult life experiences assume that everybody else in their life is going to be like that. So many of them start to engage in rejective behavioral patterns. They push you away by their behaviors. And if we buy into that and think it's about us, we're going to make it worse. But if we understand it and remain calm and cool, no touch, no call, no eye contact, we can mediate the children's behavioral pattern in ways that interrupt that fight or flight and also model appropriate behaviors on how to problem solve. One last thought, little kids need to be scripted. They don't know what to do when, when there's a problem. And we have to script and give them two or three choices and teach them that and practice it in real time so that they see that there's ways to solve their problems. And we can't assume that a child knows how to solve a problem because you saw them behave over here a few minutes ago. That's not relevant to the discussion. Kids have to know what their choices are and we have to practice and teach them and we have to provide it in every environment that they're in. So in connection with that same question, Kelly's asking if you would agree that we help small children by being reliable and predictable, consistent and kind. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. There is no doubt about it. It's such a critical aspect of what it is. And by the way, it's just not kind and reliable and consistent uh, when life is good. It's all the time. And, and, and this is important. I want to make sure I mention this. It's impossible for a parent or an adult not to feel emotions and to feel revved up sometimes. That's not a problem as long as you explain it to children, as long as you say to them, I wasn't myself a few minutes ago, or I'm sorry for doing what I did. That's not who I am. How about all of us as adults? How many times have you ever gotten in an argument with somebody you care about and you ended up saying something that perhaps you regretted? And then later on, you wouldn't, you couldn't really completely apologize for it and say to them, I'm sorry, I'm not. That really isn't me. That doesn't represent who I am. What a helpful thing when you can do that for adults' relationships, but particularly for kids. So yes, we need to provide that, but we also have to tell them when we're a little out of sorts and explain to them that that's okay and show them how we mediate that, how we calm ourselves down. You could, as a teacher or as an adult, could just say, you know what, I'm, I'm a little upset. I feel uncomfortable here. Let's just take five minutes and I'm going to, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to read a book and you go over there and read a book because you're going to help me so I can help myself. Showing kids and modeling those behavior patterns are something we can do every day. It takes time to do that, but it's real time stuff that has to happen. So Cheryl is asking if you can suggest um, how to get a child to talk versus acting out or giving the middle finger or saying F you when they're kind of going through something. How do you get them to talk? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, first of all, you know, let's make the assumption they can talk, okay? Um, and and for some kid, believe it or not, and, and I know this seems counterintuitive, but the minute you use your words or a child uses their words to express their frustration, you're on a path to a, a bad outcome. So frankly, using physical gestures is actually a better alternative than using your words because 
it has a different, it certainly, while it's hurtful and offensive, again, you have to depersonalize it. The reality simply is, is that physical gestures have less emotional feelings. If I wanted you to quiet down, for example, and I taught you a, a gesture that every time I see you talking to your neighbor and I went like this and touched my cheek, the impact of that's going to be much different pre-teaching that, by the way, than if I say to you, Tara, you need to be quiet. You need to sit down and quit talking to your neighbor. Because the minute I do that, I'm inviting a response back to you and saying, you might say, I'm not talking. She's talking to me. And then it escalates beyond that. So one number one is to, to do that. Secondly, encouraging replacement behaviors. Most adults think the goal is to stop inappropriate behavior. It is not. Um, bad behavior almost never goes away. What you want to do is teach a replacement. So what do you want the child to do to express their frustration and anger? You have to model that. You have to teach it. You have to have a structured and consistent way to talk about that. And there are many different programs. Stop and Think, Project Achieve out of University of Arkansas. Second step, great stuff about scripting and processing. Even uh, I like zones of regulation, often used in many of our schools that really show kids colors about manifestations. So resistance follows a very, very distinct pattern. And behavior comes from two forms, biology and learned. And we need to recognize we have to manage both and understand the biology, but more importantly, understand the learned behaviors. What life lessons has that kid been taught at home? in terms of his reactions and what are we going to do about it in our school environment? So, so there's great resources for that as well. Thank you. So you talked a lot about letting children kind of own their feelings, um, but then also that helping them recognize that happiness. So would you suggest if a child is in kind of a sad place and helping them express that, do we try to flip it into finding a happy place or do we let them kind of process that sad and then maybe you know 10 15 an hour later we kind of try to hit that happiness point you know that's a great question and and first of all we always want to be there and be and be meaningful in our guidance but let's just take adults for a minute how many of the people that are listening today what works for you when you're anxious and you're uncomfortable and you're sad doesn't it help for you to go someplace in your quiet place and recharge and maybe in 15 minutes or a half an hour, you start to feel better about yourself. And the answer is the same thing applies to children. But we need to do it in a prescriptive and a root, routinized way. We don't allow children to make the decisions to excuse themselves because then some kids become manipulative and controlling and their intent is not the same. We have to build that into our day and we have to talk about it. You know, I, I will say, and it, it, it's a bit uncomfortable to share this and say it, but I'm going to anyway, because it's what I feel and see, is that everybody is talking about behavioral health in our schools, in our world, and everybody talks about anxiety and all the things that we seem to have lost. But I will tell you, I still hear many, many conversations about people saying, but you know what, we got to find out this academic stuff, or we have to do this, and we have to focus on this recognizing that some of the behavioral patterns that we're gonna see in children will not manifest themselves for six to nine months from this last life experience. And that means that we might get on our merry way in our academic treadmill that I talked about, but all of a sudden we're gonna find ourselves stopped in the middle and recognizing that there's some residual needs that are going on here we should have addressed. I liken it to like a, a leak in your faucet and you see it, and when you go downstairs and you see a drip or a, a, a spot on the ceiling, and if you ignore that, that spot on the ceiling, it's at your own peril. You should go up and you should fix the leak because it may be bigger than you think and it may be deeper than you think. And the same thing comes with behavioral health. So in, in answer to that, I think it's critical and important for us to acknowledge happiness and have children own it, but we also have to provide the opportunity for them to recognize that life is a struggle too, in a way that they can understand, obviously. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, thank you. We don't have any more questions in the chat, but if anybody has anything, certainly feel free to enter anything. But um, otherwise, anything else that you wanted to add, Dr. Hartwig? Otherwise, we're pretty much right at our time. Okay, no, I just wanted to, again, thank everybody for, uh, coming tonight and appreciate the opportunity and I hope that uh, your future 
sessions are positive and, and well attended. There's some lot of good stuff and availability, and, and uh, this is the time to take advantage of it. So thank you for doing that, and thank you for asking me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, everyone, for coming on board, and we hope to see you in the next few weeks as we transition through May. So okay. getting a lot of thank yous in the comments now. So <laughs> Great. Good deal. Great. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. See you, Kelly. See you, Tara.